Good morning, New Mount Zion family and visitors, and welcome to this week's online Sunday School class with Bible study material developed and printed by the National Baptist Convention of America Press for its instructors of Sunday School classes designed to help us on this journey of understanding and of how to apply God's word in our daily living. Let us go before the Lord in prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed would be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We humble ourselves in your presence, remembering the wondrous works that you have already done we pray for your mercy in the name of Jesus the Christ, for our salvation of our souls. Protect us from any hurt, harm, or danger that may come our way. Bless the under shepherd of this place of worship, continuing to hold the bloodstained banner for all of us to see God's grace through the everlasting salvation. We start this day claiming victory in the face of uncertainty to step out on another day's journey. Heal those that continue to fall ill. We accept your will in our lives for your will surpasses all understanding. We ask that you hear our prayers, O Lord, empower this your servant to rightfully divide your words of truth for your glory. For our peace of minds abides in your love for us. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, we all together, wherever we might be, say amen. This is June the 6th in the year of our Lord 2021. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. As said in Psalms 100, verse 5 of the King James Version of the Bible, let everyone under the sound of my voice say, Amen. To our visitors, Pastor Reverend Larry L. Roundtree II, welcome you to the New Mount Zion family of born again believers, where we are with God's grace, changing the world through the love of Christ, one soul at a time. I am Reverend Dr. George Berry and will be your facilitator for our class today as we discuss what do we do when our basic needs are not met, as we often struggle to meet our own basic needs as we see them before seeking God to meet those needs in his way and the way we should seek God for all our needs and not just the big stuff. We are continuing our study of our quarterly theme, We Are the Body of Christ. Under the quarterly theme of We Are the Body of Christ, this week's lesson focuses on why we can't seek after God to re receive all of our needs. Again, we are reminded in our study today that our Bible points to us having not because we ask not. Notice, if you will, how we often will struggle to meet our own basic needs before seeking God to meet those needs in his way. Do you really know what are the five basic needs? They are, according to Maslow, physiological needs, safety needs, 
love and belonging needs, esteem needs, and self-actualization needs. Relax, we're not going to go there today, but we are going to see what the Bible says about whatever those needs may be. Our lesson scripture for today will be found in Matthew, the sixth chapter, the 25th through the 34th verses. Our lesson focus this morning, seek after God, receive all you need. We all want to be freed from worry. Don't we want to live carefree? Let's try and point you to the right understanding, or shall we say mindset, to live life effectively. How are we to be freed from worry? In his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus specifically addressed worry and urged his listeners to untangle themselves from being overly concerned about daily needs such as food and clothing, worry that's on one's mind, is overwhelmed by negative and fearful thoughts. It's similar to a relentless army marching back and forth. How do I figure this out? How do I fix that? What can I do about this or that? What if X happens. These kinds of distractions are unnecessary and contrary to God's desire. When the mind is stressed out, there's very little or no time to meditate on what's on God's heart and pursue spiritual matters. Look at nature. Jesus drew his audience's attention to nature the birds, the flowers, grass. Our feathery friends wake up each morning anticipating worms in the ground or fish in the lake. They expect the Father's attentiveness to their needs. In the same way, the Heavenly Father longs for His children to share the same expectancy of His care. Aren't human beings worth more than birds and flowers? How to stop worrying? How does one accept Jesus' invitation to worry-free living? Is it possible to stop the persistent habit? First of all, Jesus said, realize anxieties accomplish nothing. It distractively eats away at the inside of one's body. Second, ask different questions. Wake up in the morning and seek what the Father is up to that day. Holy Spirit, where will you lead me? Lord, how can I join with you in your work? building up your kingdom here on earth. Kingdom work should be God's children's primary concern. Ask God to transform your thought life, behaving each day. The worm is already in the ground for breakfast, so now my needs are met. I can turn my thinking toward God what he wants for and of my day. That's an indication he is the top priority. He is in his proper place as God. Seek him. He's the one in control and limited. And lastly, if you must be distracted with your troubles, limit it to today, not next week, next month, or year. 
It's okay to make plans for the future. It's natural to think back on past mistakes, grieve over poor decisions, but that don't dwell on, don't dwell on it either. Live in the right now. The key to worry-free living is to seek God earnestly. Look to him and him alone as your source for all things. Freed from worry. Here are several questions on being freed from worry. Why is worry usually the first thing we do when our needs are not met? Why is worry considered a time killer? Instead of worrying, why should we seek God first and trust him to meet our needs? On this first question, this allows us to reflect on why we tend to immediately start to worry when we perceive needs are not met. Even as Christians, we are human beings. We worry about our needs and self-reliance instead of praying and trusting God to meet those needs. Number two, worrying is useless because we are not omnipotent as God is and our efforts does nothing but take our time from focusing on God and his provisions, ability to see into the future. Instead of worrying about our needs, we should be seeking a closer relationship with God first, trusting him to meet our needs. Direct, direct all our being to him to turn from worrying, this negatively thinking instead of proactively thinking and focusing on God. God is who promises to meet all our needs. Share the successes of God's hand in your life with someone else. Have you done that lately? The victories on how God has met a need in your life can also be in their lives after we've stopped worrying and prayed to God. If God can take care of the birds, the lilies of the field, and even more, can he take care of our needs? For all power is in his hand. Trust and believe unwaveringly. Notice these key points as we review in our scripture about Jesus teaching seeking God for our needs. Here in Matthew, the futility of worry. I will reflect from the the New International Version, which is in the bold. And as you have time, come back and read the King James Version, which we're used to looking at. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear, is not life more than food and the body than clothes? Look at the birds in the air. They do not sow or weep or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worry, add a single hour to your life? In his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus taught the people about 
Christian living through rhetorical questions. For example, if God provides for the birds who aren't formed in his image, wouldn't he provide for people as well? Jesus asked the people, if life isn't more than what you eat and your body's more than what you wear. He also asked if worrying can improve your physical state or future. The answer, of course, is no. Futility of worry. What did Jesus point to as common areas of worry? In the terms of inherent worry, how did people compare to birds? The Savior noted that people often stress over various aspects of their temporal earthly existence. For instance, both saved and unsaved were anxious about getting enough to eat and drink in Matthew the sixth chapter in the 25th verse. Likewise, they fretted over the clothes they wore. On one hand, Jesus affirmed that the birds of the air in verse 26 had some intrinsic value as earthly creatures. Yet, on the other hand, people by comparison had far greater inherent worth. Indeed, from the perspective of the Creator, people are much more valuable. Along with Jesus, Paul also taught about worrying, especially in Philippians 4, 6, and 7. In fact, the Greek verb rendered worry in Matthew, verse 25, is the same word translated anxious in Philippians 4 and 6. Paul told his friends not to fret over any self-centered concerns, for such anxiety could become all-consuming. It took their minds off of what was important to God and focused attention on themselves. As they became increasingly self-absorbed, they were unable to rejoice during hard times and be gentle with friends and foes alike. Paul taught that prayer was the best remedy for anxiousness. When his readers turned to God and surrendered their anxieties to him, God, God's peace could reach their innermost being. Paul did not imply that the believer's burdens would vanish nor was he talking about the sheer exhortation of well-being and willpower. Rather, it was an inner space that could come only from God and was beyond human understanding. The lesson from nature is this. Let's read verse 28 through 30 in the Matthew the sixth chapter where it reads and why do you worry about clothes see how the flowers of the field grow they do not labor or spin yet I tell you that not even Solomon with all his splendor was dressed like one of these if that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Jesus directed the people to examine how God created and provides for nature takes care of his garden. 
If God can clothe the grass even finer than all of Solomon's clothes, can he not provide for them? Worrying demonstrates too little faith in God. The lesson from nature is this. How did Jesus argue against the compulsion to worry about what he wore or what we will wear? What was the nature of the argument Jesus made in Matthew, the sixth chapter? The Savior addressed the issue in two ways. First, he noted that lilies carpeting a field did not have to work hard making their own clothing. Second, despite this truth, they were arrayed more beautifully than even King Solomon in all his finery and jewelry. And Jesus reasoned from a lesser truth to a greater one. In particular, the Lord clothed wild grass growing in a field that existed for a moment. Since God valued his spiritual ch children so much more, it was certain that he would also ensure that they were clothed too. The divine prescription for anxiety is here in Matthew as we read the sixth chapter the 31st through the 34th verses in the NIV it says so do not worry saying what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear for the pagans run after all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Somebody say amen. Jesus instructed us not to worry about our basic needs such as food and clothing. Unbelievers worry because they don't have a heavenly father to trust to provide these needs. We should replace worrying with seeking God and obeying his word. We should also live one day at a time trusting God for today and not worrying about tomorrow. Good God Almighty. The divine prescription for anxiety is this. What is the implication of Jesus pointing to believers' relationship with God? And what did Jesus say were the two foremost priorities for his disciples? Jesus stated that his followers belonged to their heavenly Father. The implication is that the Lord cares greatly for his children. This includes knowing what they need and providing them with basic necessities, as we see in verse 32. The Savior highlighted two areas of concern that his followers need to pursue in verse 33. The first priority is to affirm and submit to God's rule in their lives. The second priority, like unto this, is to, to take in and live out God's righteousness in an upright and virtuous manner among their fellow human beings. 
And that does not mean to turn up our noses at someone else. We are not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought. Anonymously, this understanding came from no uncertain person and we're not to take it into greater context than what we've already discovered. What is the difference between basic needs and wants? Good question. And how have you seen God meet your basic needs or that of others? And lastly, what role does prayer have in God meeting our needs? As human beings, our basic needs can become confused with our wants. Our needs keep multiplying as we think. For example, cell phones are now a need rather than a want. We forget who provides for us, or we forget the times God has provided for us in the past when we have a need in the present. We should pray that he provides our daily bread and also ask for the wisdom and insight to recognize his provisions. I'm not preaching. I'm just stating that we are to see our God first, last, and always. Seek him for remedy to whatever may come our way. Seek him. Yes, go and seek him. Matthew 32b and 33 says, and your heavenly father knows that you need them but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well our class has learned the importance of trusting god to provide for all our needs as we seek him first read seek him in your student books and remember the exercise there with the use of acrostic memorization often we want god to meet our needs without us making our relationship with god a priority the concept of seeking god is active not passive we are to believe who God is, desire to know him better, and walk in obedience to his will for our lives. Amen. Remember to seek God first and trust him for your needs. Let us review our key verse for today and leave with that on our heart. And your heavenly Father knows that you need him, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Amen. Next week's assignment is to read Matthew, the eighth chapter, the 23rd, through the 27th verses. After this session, take a few minutes to reflect on Matthew 6, 33 through 34, and pray that God will empower you all to be able to refocus your minds on him first and not worry about tomorrow. Be encouraged to seek God first this week and not to worry carry your weapons with you and 
when you find yourself worrying, read anywhere in Proverbs until your worrying stops for the moment and trust God. Before next week, no things or situations that lead us to panic as you study Matthew, the eighth chapter in the 23rd through 23rd verses. Now we close this study in this manner. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to call on you for help in our daily living. Refocus our minds on you first and not worry about tomorrow. Having been given a right relationship with you through the Savior of us all, Jesus the Christ. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and ever. And we all say, Amen.